Okay, all right, let's get started. So let's continue from last time. So if you remember where we added up last time, basically we said we use power flow to, uh, for example, look at planning or operations. And uh, if you have, you know, one area, so you have area A, transmitting power to area B, and uh, depending on the solution of the power flow equations, you know, if the voltage is too high or the transmission is too high, there's various things we can do in the network, right, to push the operating point closer to our liking. So one thing that's interesting in power system is we often have the following situation. So for example, let's say we have three buses. Let's say we have A, B, and C. So let's say this is our situation. Let's say this is a generator. This is a load. And this is a load. Okay. So let's say that I have a load growth in C. Let's say this increases. This increases, some load increases. Is it possible just to send some more power from A to C? So this is one question we want to understand, and this one what makes power system a little bit peculiar compared to other systems. Right? So, right, so I say we have a connected system, and there's a loop inside it, and I want to send, you know, let's say one megawatt more power from A to C, and not disturb any of the other flows. Is it possible in this case? Is it possible to send one more unit on some line without changing the flow on other lines? Okay, right. So, so no. turns out there's something interesting about power system that's not possible to arbitrarily change the flow on a line without disturbing the flow on other lines. Okay, so that's what's different, right? So if you have a, let's say a, so imagine if you have a communication network. Okay, let's say you have a communication network. You have a source sending to two destinations. Then for a communication network, it's very easy to increase a flow here. On one edge is possible. Okay. We do those things on the internet all the time. If one, you know, you want, you need some more data to a particular node in the network, you just increase the bandwidth, right, in this node, or you send more packets along this way, right? So this is possible for communication network. Uh, it's possible, for example, in transportation network, right? So. If you, you know, if you have three cities, you can just, you know, send more traffic in one route without disturbing in some other route. However, you look at power, I say this, let's say you look at power here, then it turns out it's not possible to just change. Okay, it's not possible. Uh, so if you are demanding to say, I need more power flow from A to B, but I don't want to change the flow on A, sorry, A to C, let's be clear. Right, so if you're saying, I just want to add one more unit of power, let's say here, without changing the flow on the other two edges, it turns out to be not possible. Yeah, you cannot arbitrarily pick a line in the power system and say, let's flow more power along this line. Okay, so let's physically can't do this. Can anybody think of a reason why? Right, so this is something special of the power system and doesn't necessarily show up for other networks. So why is it in power that I cannot just go to a line and just change the flow on that line? 
right? If C demands more power, A is a generator, why can't I just send more power from A to C? And leave B alone, for example. All right, so what's special about power? It's something like okay, so if you look at this system, what happens is it's important to remember power flow is driven by, say, a difference in angle. Okay? Power flow is driven by difference in angle. And now, so, right, so how many angles do I have in this system? Right, so the degree of freedom, so in a power system, there's the flows are driven by angle or the active flows are by angle difference. And there are only n minus what angles to choose from, right? So the degree of freedom, at least in angles, is only a minus one, okay? And so you don't have enough degrees of freedom to individually adjust, to individually adjust the power flow on each of the edges. Okay? So this is actually something uh, not so trivial and uh, many people, or, you know, it's not uh, often understood, but this is important in power systems. Okay. So let's be a little bit more, right? So let's adding, a, so let's look at an example why this is the case. Okay. So let's imagine I have, okay, let's say I have three buses, one, two, three. And uh, say the lines are entirely inductive, let's say B13, B23, minus B12. Okay, so these are pure inductive lines. So then the flow, let's say from one to two, this is given by B12 sine theta one minus theta two. Okay. This is the flow. And then we're gonna approximate we're gonna assume that one minus theta two is small. Okay, we're gonna assume this is small. So sine of the angle is roughly just the angle difference. Okay, so this is approximating sine x by just x. Okay, so we have f12 is b12 theta one minus theta two. And similarly, F23 is B23, theta two minus theta three. F31 is B13, theta three. Okay, so once we assume the angles are small, we get the sort of linear power flow equations. These are sort of so-called DC power flow equations. So if we look at the three flows, they're driven by this angle differences. There's actually a linear relationship between all those flows. Okay, they're actually linearly dependent. For example, I can sum it this way. Okay, let's do the sum. If I sum things in this way, what happens is I have theta one minus theta two plus theta two minus theta three plus theta three minus theta one, right? I divide the line emittance out of it. Then I cut, I, I get a sum of angles. Okay? I got sum a bunch of angles. So what is this sum equal to? Zero. What is the sum equal to? If you just look at the sum. This is just zero, right? So this is sum is zero. So this is zero. So what this tells you is the flows actually dependent on each other. Okay, so I cannot, for example, arbitrarily change one of them. 
because by the physics of how power flows, they must sum up, right? They must sum up to zero. Okay. So if you look at this network again, if I want to increase the flow from one to two, right? So if we increase a flow from one to two, there must be some other changes in the buses to, for, to cancel out this flow, right? To make sure this linear equation holds. Okay, so this cannot be done independently. There is probably some other flows in the network as well to balance this out. Okay, this must be some other flows here. Okay. And this turns out to have a lot of practical impact. Right, this, was, this is what makes a power system uh, difficult to manage, or not difficult, but interesting to manage. Right? Okay. So any question with this calculation before we go into some of the practical implications of this? Okay. And this happens for all the flow. Yeah. Questions? Go ahead. Professor, should we just pay attention to like the, the direction? Because one, two, and the F two, three, so the third one should be the F one, two, three. Oh, no, I just number three, one, right? I just number this way. Okay. So I want to look at three, two, one, right? Because it's, it's a cycle. I mean, you can put F one, three here, and all it introduces is a negative sign in front of the term. So it's okay. still some linear equation that must hold. Okay. Right, so the point is there's a coupling, the point is there's a equation that couples the flow together. Right, because the flows are driven by angle differences and a weighted sum of the flows just turns out to be zero because all the angles can. Okay. So this happens, this here we made the linear approximation, but for the actual power flow equations, the same, essentially the same intuition carries over. There's only so many angles you can change in the network. Okay. There are only so many angles. And uh, because there are only n minus one degrees of freedom for angles, turns out all the line flows are coupled to each other. Okay, you have this sort of equation that must hold. And this is essentially a realization of Kirchhoff's voltage law. Okay, so you look at Kirchhoff's voltage law, it says the voltage drop in any closed loop must add up to zero. And this is a realization of that. Basically, it comes down from Kirchhoff's voltage law. Here, if you look at the flow, the summation of the flow in a loop, you know, a weighted sum of the flow in your loop ends up to be zero. So this is a sort of one realization of Kirchhoff's law. And this is sort of far from a, just a sort of curiosity. This has a lot of practical implications right? because in the real world, most of the time the network is looped. There are loops in the system. Okay. So there are loops in the system. So if there are loops in the system, then what you happen is, let's say you have A, B, C, right, tying to this other. There are always some loop flow that happens in this cycle. Okay. There's always things looping across each other, okay. looping around. And what the Practical implication is basically what happens is you cannot arbitrarily change the flow. So if you so let's say if C wants more power, it has to deal with both A and B. It has to deal with both A and B. So if, even if C goes to a generator, let's say A is a generator, and say sell me more power, then B has to necessarily get involved because of power flows in a loop, right? And this has the real world implication because as, if you look at the US, these, basically what happens is, so if you look at the Western part of the US, we have British Columbia in Canada, Washington, Oregon, California, and let's say here is Nevada. So what power flows is normally power flows this way. You have this sort of cycle, going back in the US. Those power flows essentially from BC all the way through to California. But since the system is a loop, there is a reverse flow going the other way. And this is the endless 
uh, this is sort of creates a lot of losses. Basically, what Nevada or some other what a lot of states says, oh, you know, I don't want other people's power flowing through my system. Okay, it's not desirable. I build my system. I don't want other people using. It. Right? If you if BC wants to sell power to California, BC can sell power to California. I don't want any of this flow showing up in my system. But it's not physically possible to do that. Okay, it's a loop system. Some flow has to go across, you know, other parts of the system. And then you get at least losses, people suing each other, saying, oh, why is people using my lines? I don't want other people using my lines. And uh, basically, a lot of times is you spend time, you know, explain to people that's just not how power flows. And in practice terms, as if you look at the market, the market becomes very complicated because people's flows going all over the place. And they may not be owned by the same entity. For example, here you're crossing countries. You have, you know, hydro, the BC Hydro, going to California ISO, going to some, you know, going through BPA. There's a lot of actual market implications for this. And it's not easy to work this out. And another example you see for this is Brexit. Right? So, you know, for Brexit, Great Britain decides to leave European Union. And the one part of their thing is, okay, I want to control my own infrastructure, including the power system. But it's a power system that's part of the European power system. So it's impossible just to draw a line and say, okay, you know, nothing flows from EU to the, to the British power system, right? It just doesn't work that way. So if you go actually read the menu for Brexit, a sort of interesting exercise, look at the section that deals with, with power systems as a hundred something pages. The reason is a hundred something pages is essentially to deal with this kind of loop flow. Some power has to flow through all parts of the system. And uh, it's very non-trivial to find something that you know, makes people happy policy-wise versus the physical reality of just, this is how electrons want to flow in a system. Okay, so this happens a lot. This happens quite a bit. Right, so any questions about that? So if you work for an operator, you'll be dealing with some aspect of this. Actually, even if you work for a utility, you'll be dealing with some aspect of this. Like somebody will ask you, oh, you know, why can't I just get power from this specific power plant to my load? And the reason is power doesn't flow that way. That's not the way that power flows. Okay, and this is also why a power system is very different than let's say an internet. Okay, there may hear, you know, people say, we want to make the power system more like the internet. I want to think of power as packets flowing in the network. That's not necessarily the way it will happen. Right? Because for internet, you know, if you transmit a packet, it goes from a source to a destination. But in power, there's necessarily you have to split power, right? You cannot basically control where current goes, current flows according to Kirchhoff laws. Okay, so this is the fact of life for power systems. So what do you do, right? So what do you do? Sometimes this becomes so undesirable. It's so hard to sort out this flows. What you have, what you can do is to basically uh, put a device called a phase shifter. Okay, what's called a phase shifter. What phase shifter does is remember the loop flows come from that the angles are all coupled, right? So angles are all coupled and the power flow is driven by the angle. So what this phase shifter does for us is this basically can control the phase difference or the angle difference, right? Control the phase difference. So control the phase. And what this does is, is basically says it gives control of line flow on a single line. Okay, so if you have a phase shifter, basically if you allow it to rotate angles, then it decouples the power flow. It decouples the line flows between all the lines because now you can introduce sort of this sort of arbitrary phase shape in the line. 
Okay, so let's say you really want to just flow from power from A to C without doing anything to the other lines, you can add a phase shifter here. Okay, and this phase shifter basically allow you to control the flow on this line. Okay, and this is not often used. Okay, this are few phase shifters in the system, but it's not often used. And the reason is it's just not easy to make a phase shifter. It's not terribly easy to do this. So for you guys, can you think of a way to shape the phase, shape the angle on the line? Is there a way you can think of to do this? Let's say I want, I really want to change the phase on a transmission line. So can I think of a way to do this? Is there a way to, how will you make a phase shifter? How will you make a device that basically take the sinusoid waves and just shape the face of the sinusoid? There is one simple solution that shifts the face by a discrete amount. Can I think of that? So let's say I have a transformer. Is there a way to do a phase shifting through a transformer? Well, like a Y delta or delta Y shifted by 30 degrees? Right, so one easy thing to do is you can shift by 30 degrees because you can have a Y delta transformer, right? So one way to do this is to have a Y connection that goes through a transformer, comes out to be a delta connection. Okay, this gives you a 30 degrees angle shift, right? Just because of the way Y and delta works. So that's a 30 degrees angle shift. But to shift it by arbitrary angle becomes much more difficult. Because that's not easy. That's why we don't use fish shifters all that often. And for you know, in one, I think in the Western Interconnect, you may see like a few fish shifters. They just become so expensive to make one. Right nowadays, one, one way you can make fish shifters is just to do this sort of ACDC. Right, so one way you can do this is to do this kind of conversion, ACDC. Because once you shift to DC, right, there's no phase anymore, and you can do whatever you want to this. And then once you convert back to AC, you can artificially uh, change the phase, right? It's a power, it's an electronic shift. Okay? So this is one way to do it. But this is a good, very, very expensive. You're talking about a line that's carrying less than 100 megawatt of power. Okay, this is not easy to do. Okay, so right, so phase shifter is all nice, makes computation easier, but it's expensive. And the one area you see this is actually in a wind turbine. So if you take 451, we'll see something like AC, DC, DC, AC conversion. That's because you have, you need to control the phase. Okay. But wind turbine is not a hundred megawatt. Okay. It's not a hundred megawatt. So for something, you know, 100 megawatt, 500 megawatt, phase shifter is very expensive. We don't use it. But this creates a lot of interesting market challenges, especially. Because we need to store it out, you know, where do you power flow to? You know, you're, if you're using somebody else's system, how does that get accounted? And all this become an interesting question. All right. So that's what active power, you know, controlling active power in the system is now trivial. The phase shifter is just very expensive to build. Any questions about this? Okay, so right, so this is just so one thing to take one takeaway message is in a network, if you transmitting power from one point to another point, is never that simple. Okay, it's one, you know, you want to change anything, one low changes, everything else or shifts around. Right? And that's a that's why it makes power systems so coupled. Right? Just a couple infrastructure. Right? It's not a you know it's more complicated, for example, than a transportation system. Right? It's more complicated than the internet. Right? So that's why the math, if you know go on in this area, the math will be different. Okay? So it's sort of a different way of doing math for this. So and so in comparison, in comparison, reactive power control is a lot easier. 
Okay, so reactive power control, because reactive power, what we can do is, it does not require anything that generates energy or you know, stores energy, or actually it does not require a sort of fancy electronic uh, device per se. All it requires is a capacitor and the inductors. So it's much, much easier to compensate for reactive power, right? You can add a, for example, you can add this thing in parallel, you can, let's say you have a normal line, you can add a switching inductor, a switching capacitor. So all of these are the things you can do. Right? So you, we see this kind of things often for reactive power control. Okay, we we'll see reactive power control, but not so much for active power. Right? So that's the difference between the two. Right? Because Again, if you go back to last lecture, the reason is active power is driven by angles. And angles turns out to obey something like Kirchhoff's voltage law in this case. Right? Where reactive power, you know, you can put you know, stick a capacitor at some point. That will give you some reactive power, not so much for active power. Okay? The rest of this class, we just want to see an example. So I want to show you one example of this working out in a actual system. So this is one example of an actual system. And this is something generated by Power World. So if you have seen Power World before, you, will see, you have seen the picture like this. So we decide not to do Power World. We decide not to do a, a homework question, for example, in Power World. So we're going to just use this as an example. What this example shows is basically if you have some generators, so these are generators here, right? These are some generators, there are some loads in the system, right? And the color basically tells you the voltage. Okay, color tells you the voltage. So green means good, okay? So green is good. Yellow is high voltage, for example, a little bit high. Right, green is close to one, yellow is you know, high voltage, blue is lower voltage. So often this is the picture you'll see if you sit in a control center. You basically have this picture up on the board, up on a monitor, and you look at the colors. So what you want to see is mostly green, right? And uh, this is an example of a good operating state, right? You look up, you see mostly green, the voltages are okay, voltages are okay. And uh, the voltages are okay because you have a fairly light load. Okay, you have a fairly light load, and uh, you know your the load is light, and uh, the voltages are all fine in this case. So what happens once you increase the load? If you go from 400 to 600, so this was 400 before, you increase to 600. We well, start to see uh, you start to see some voltage drop in the system, right? You start to see some blue here, where you're closer to the where you're closer to the load, the voltage starts to drop. So you see some light blue. For example, this is 0.92. This is 0.92 per unit voltage. So if you're an operator, you start to see this kind of color scheme, you're kind of worried, right? You're kind of worried. So if you're let's so a some rule of thumb. So for a voltage system, what is a you know what is a good number for voltage? What is a good range for voltage you like to see if you operate it in per unit terms? Right? When do you press a red big red button if you see you know? Right? So so what is a correct operating range or the desirable operating range? Does anybody know? Per voltage, we have a guess. So it's one per unit as normal operation, right? So the re the range we want to see is something like 0.95 to 1.05 per unit for voltage. Okay, so we want to see this. If you deviate into a lot outside this range, then there we start having problems. So what physically goes wrong if you deviate law from this range? For example, let's say you increase this to 800 megawatts, 
you see dark blue because you have something like 0 0.8, 1 0.83 per unit voltage. So physically, what goes wrong, right? So if you're an operator, you see this picture on your screen, you're very worried. Okay, you're extremely worried if you see this. Meaning, you know, your system is close to being collapsed, right? It's close to being not working anymore. But physically, what's so bad if your voltage is, you know, 0.81 per unit? What equipment does not like operating at uh, very far away from one per unit? The generators? So the generators are mostly fine, right? Because generator, we can, they, have, they can do their own voltage control. Right? So generators, you know, if it's can, within a wide range can basically set their voltage. Right? That's why these are sort of PV buses. A generator has this sort of control. Right? It, it has to operate at a particular voltage, but has a capability of setting its voltage. So generally, for, even in this case, you don't see the generator voltage deviating too far from one per unit. They're okay. So what other device, right? So the chest has transformers, right? So transformers have problems if you deviate too far away from their rated voltage. Right? So remember when we did the per unit systems, we said, you know, for a transformer, the per unit voltage refers to the transformer rated voltage. And if you deviate too far away from it, your transformers are not happy. Okay? These are, they cannot operate very long. A voltage that's very far away from one per unit. Okay, so that's why we want to keep the voltage in all the system close to one per unit. Otherwise, your transformer really starts to complain about this. Okay. So, right, so if you see a picture like this, you get worried, basically, you get very worried. And uh, you try to make some, uh, you basically try to compensate for this somehow. Okay, so you try really try to compensate for this. So what are the things you can do to compensate for this, right? If you see, you know, this is decreasing quite a bit, what can you do? Well, one thing you can do is to, you know, turn on some generators. Okay, for example, this generator is still off. So one thing we can do is to turn this generator off. Okay, so we can use this generator to generate some power to alleviate the voltage drop. Okay. So we have a generator closer to the load, we can turn it on, and we can sort of uh, turn the generator on, we can boost the voltage a little bit. Okay, we can boost the voltage. So this is not great, this is not great, because the generator is not providing reactive power. So it only provides active power, Actually, we still have voltage problems. We still have voltage problems. We have some sort of dark blue areas. So it'd be better if the generator, for example, can provide both reactive and active power, right? So it provides both megawatt and megawatt, and then that makes the voltage a lot better. The so voltage situation looks a lot better. Okay. okay. So this is one way to deal with it. This is one way to deal with it. There's multiple ways to deal with this, however, right? If you don't want to turn the generator, another thing you can do is you can turn on this capacitor. So we can switch on this capacitor. Remember, capacitor boosts voltage. So we switch on this capacitor, we can, uh, we can sort of provide more uh, reactive power and that will make the voltage increase. Because there's multiple things you can do. And this basically gives you a flavor if you're sitting in the control center you sort of have to determine what you do. Right, let's say you see the voltage all keeps on dropping and then you have different options. Right? Think of you're flying a aircraft, right? So think of you fly an airplane. Vast majority of the time, the airplane flies fine. There's autopilot, you don't need to do anything. You just sit there. However, when something goes wrong, right? Then the other pilot needs to do some actions. And you ever think an airplane cockpit is very complicated. There's sort of, many, many buttons you can push. And it's a little bit similar if you operate. You're sitting in the control center, vast majority of the time, you actually, you don't need to be there. Okay, the system works. You know, you take a few calls, you look at your, you look at your board, you drink coffee, and uh, you know, it's been eight hours and nothing happens. Sometimes things get interesting. For example, if this happens, your life suddenly becomes very interesting, and your job is to determine what to do. 
Hey, do you call backup generation? Do you switch on capacitor? Do you share load? Do you call the nearing system and say, okay, what happened? Right, so this is your life becomes a lot more interesting. So these are some choices you have. These are some of the choices you have. And uh, you know you can look at more other things, right? Then uh, your choices, you know, not just with voltage. For example, another thing that may go wrong if you're sending a control center is this may suddenly overflow, right? And you may suddenly say, "Oh, there have an outage. There's something wrong with my line," and then suddenly exceeding capacity. So this is another sort of big warning sign you have. The board was flashing. Okay, I have a line over capacity. Well, what do you do? And then your choice, there, there are choices you can make. Here, for example, you can say, I have a generator here, right? I have a generator here, it's not producing power. But since I have a line over capacity, maybe I should turn this on. And so the line doesn't have to carry so much power. For example, one thing you can do is you can turn on your generator and the line can, you know, the line is okay. Now. So if you're sitting again, if your operator is, you have a lot of options, right? you, have, you know, there's things that can go wrong. You have many options you can do. Basically, you need to figure out what to do and figure out what to do. If you're sitting in the control center. Okay? And it's not simple. It is by no means simple, right? This is, you know, there's a combat. There's many generate. This is actually a very small system. Okay, you know, if you're a generator, you're mo mostly looking at much, much larger systems. Okay. So, and uh, so one thing, you know, to think about is there's actually not that many people in the control center, right? So let's say if you look at the fairly large system, let's say you look at the New England system, right? The six state up on the Northeast system. And this, you know, has many cities, has Boston, for example, has Connecticut, has Massachusetts, and all the way up north. Do you, how many people do you think is in the control center for that entire system, for that entire system? Is that the 10 people, right? Yeah, it's actually four people in that control center. I have been to that control center. I've inter I work there, so I know. You can look, you also, so we're not allowed to go in the control center, but there's sort of big glass walls. You can look inside. And basically there's four people. There's three people actually working in the control center. There's a supervisor. Okay, so you have one supervisor plus three people sitting in the control center looking at screens. Okay, and that system has what? A thousand something buses there. Okay, and you look at the board and if something goes wrong, now one of the three people needs to figure out what to do. Okay. So the way it works is you have to go through a lot of training. That's why we are not allowed to touch it. We are not even allowed to go into the control center. Okay. You got this menu about this big. You flip through the menu, tells you, okay, if this happens, do this. If this happens, do this. You know, if something really bad happens, call this number and figure it out. Okay. Right. And basically, it categorizes you know, all the things that can go wrong and all the actions you can do okay. through this menu. And you very well train, you run simulations all the time about the things that can go wrong and the buttons you should press and the things like this. Okay. However, however, if you look at currently the system, the control centers, people in control center, their job is becoming more and more complicated. And yeah, their jobs become more and more complicated, right? Because with all these renewables and all these uncertainties entering into the system, there's a lot more patterns, a lot more changes you see in the system, which you haven't really observed before. So your menu really cannot cover all possibilities. It's impossible to cover all possibilities. But then if you still have humans in the loop, and they still have to make decisions, but all of this sort of weird things that they may have never seen before, even in training, pop up. Then a lot of times people tend to you know, make mistakes or do the wrong thing. So this has happened in Europe. Basically in the European grid, there's some outages that are caused basically by operators not knowing what to do. Okay, so because you know, renewables, there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of variation you've never seen before and you're not sure what to do. But this is a dynamical system. So if you sit too long, the system still, you know, you, you will basically lose load. 
Okay. So you have a lot of pressure to act with situations you don't know what to do with, you have never seen before. So this is difficult. This is sort of a challenging, a sort of very challenging situation for us, right? So, you know, so there's a lot of research. If you're interested in AI, if people are talking about how to use computers, help the operators, right? So not leave the operator alone, just, you know, say there's something wrong, go deal with it. How do you assist the operators? How do you use learning? How do you run even more simulations? How do you turn, you know, the warning to something more actionable? Right? Maybe don't just say, oh, this line is overflowing. Maybe make some suggestions. Increase this generation or turn on this capacitor. There's a lot of things being talked about. So this sort of one active area of research is to say, online, if something goes wrong, how does, you know, how do you assist the human operators? How do you assist them? Right? What, can you make suggestions? Or can you prepare them better for this kind of thing? Okay. So this just gives you a feeling of, Thing that can happen in the system, right? Any questions about this? We won't do something that, like this. this. This is too hard from an optimization point of view. There are too many options for us really to go into this class. This is really sort of quite advanced stuff. And uh, um, if you go to grad school, for example, you may work on something like this, you know, learning mm -hmm. what to do. Okay. Uh, professor? Yeah. So there, if there is a lot overflow between the six and the eight bus, yeah. like how we add like so the generator to reduce the overflow? Right, so if there's overflow, meaning, right, so if you look at the system, right, so there's two generators on this side of the system. So mm -hmm. power is, you can think of flowing from left to right, right? Mm -hmm. Six to eight is carrying some of this power flow. So to reduce the amount of power you need to flow from left to right, one thing you can do is turn on the generator at the right side of the system. So you don't need so much power flow from, you know, fr from left to right. And this hopefully reduces the power flow from six to eight. In some kind of ways, cost like so we just cancel like the overflow and the, from different. So. It's really not a cancellation per se, right? So it's really that, my load is mostly in the right-hand side, my generator on the left-hand side, so there's power flow. But you have some generation closer to the load. And you don't need this much flow from the other generators. Okay. It's really not a cancellation. Right? There's nothing sort of opposing forces in that line. Okay. And also you mentioned that so we use the capacitors like so. Yeah. And is that a shunk capacitors? Yeah, this 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 capacitor here is a shunt capacitor to graph, but basically from that bus to to graph. I think the shunt capacitor is used to, or is used to boost up to the reactive power. Yeah, mainly for voltage, mainly used for voltage. Okay. Although it can help can help clearing capacity in lines. It can help clearing capacity. Yeah, okay. It's sort of tricky. It's not all that simple. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so there's a lot of options. Like if you're really an operator, you go through all of them. Like the, the training is intense. Like if you're operating a thousand bus system, and sort of figuring out what's going on and what's the right action to do is, is difficult. Okay, so this is just a taste, right? Just a taste of this, right? So, you know, in our homework, we'll ask a few questions. We'll say, okay, what happens if this, we'll basically give you a solution. We'll say, okay, if this line breaks, change the generation of this generator and see if it gets better. We won't ask you to say, this line has overflow, tell me what to do. Uh, that's sort of a very hard question. All right, we won't ask, you know, there's some voltage issues, tell me what to do. Right? Those are very hard. Well, basically suggest, you know, there's some, if this happens, observe there are voltage issues, try doing this and see if it helps. Right? These are the things we'll do. Okay, so we won't ask you to make a decision. So really the decision making process is quite complicated. And it actually flying airplane is not a bad analogy for operating a power system. It's so complicated, you have no, you basically it's so complicated. You have, you, you can know what's completely going on. But also anytime you have to make a decision, you have to make it fast. Right? And the, the, you can't shut it off. There's not an option of just stopping and trying to figure out what's going on. Right? So, you know, often this, 
And so there's a lot of critical decisions you have to make in a short amount of time. And the great hope, great hope in the industry is that, you know, if AI can play Go, maybe AI can do something here. Although that has not panned out yet, I must say. There has, that has not panned out. The AI that plays Go doesn't work very well for making policy decisions uh, for various reasons. But there's hope that, you know, some AI will do something here. Okay. All right, so that's a sort of looking at basically solving power flow and looking at things that can happen. So next, we'll go to uh, questions or? Okay, so next we'll go to something called economic dispatch. The reason it's called economic dispatch is the following, right? So let's say, normally for a system, this is sort of the grid. There's a generator, there's a lot of low demand, 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 right? And when we solve the power flow problem, we did not actually optimize anything. We basically provided all the generation values and all the demand and just say, okay, go find the voltage, right? We did not, we did not uh, optimize things. However, if you have many generators and many loads, your job is always to optimize the generation. Right? You always want to optimize generation, right? These generators can operate over a set of values. And our goal is to basically to to meet demand at minimum cost. Right? So each generator costs different has different costs. Right, so you know, for example, wind if it's available, it's actually zero cost. Nuclear and hydro are very cheap. You now gas is more expensive, and oil maybe you know very expensive things like this. Right, so there are many choices of generations we can make, and our goal is how do we optimize this? Right, how do we find the least cost generation solution? Okay, this is our goal. Right, so. So let's uh, take a break now. Let's take a break now. And when we come back at 10.30, we'll look at how to think about this sort of optimization problems, which we really haven't done before. Before it was given load and generation, go find me voltage and angle. Here we want to act, we want to ask a more decision-making process, right? This is following a line of decision-making. As I have many generators, there's many settings that can meet the load go find me the best one. And the best thing in this contract is minimum cost. Okay, so let's take a break until 10.30. Then when we come back, we'll look at the, how do we solve this sort of optimal power flow problem. A quick question. Yeah, go uh, at the very start of the lecture, I kind of yeah. missed, what is the function F12 or F23? Oh, those are the line flows on the lines. So it's not a function. This F stands for flow. It's a flow on this line. All right, it's a power flow from one to two. Okay. Okay, thank you.
All right, so let's get back to this. So for economic dispatch, the first thing we want to look at is basically is the generator characteristics. So we're going to think of a generator you know, being a simple energy conversion device. Okay? You put in some fuel, you go through a turbine, then uh, the power, electric power comes out. So to justify the cost, right? So basically the cost looks something or the energy input versus power output curve looks something like this. Okay, so on the x-axis, we have power. So this is output power. And let's go from some value P mean to P max. Okay, so for example, something like this. And then on the y-axis, we have the input. Right, so the more input, the joule per hour you put in, you get more power. Okay, so this is fairly a simple input-output relationship. And uh, for every generator, you know, basically you get a line like this. Right? So this characterized. The one thing to remember is the minimum generation of a generator is almost never zero. Okay. It's hard to run a generator at zero power, right? So for example, it's how a hydro generator generate one watt. Right? So that's not possible. So normally if the gener generator can be off, not generating anything, or if it's on, it has to generate a minimum amount of power. Okay, so normally it's not zero to a maximum. It's you know, some minimum to a maximum, right? So it has to run some minimum. We can convert this to cost. Basically, right? for a generator that has a well-defined type of fuel, for example, gas, there's a cost associated with it. Right? How much money buys, you know, I uh, buy so much gas, that translates how much money, then I get some power. Okay? So often when you look at the generator cost curve, where basically we'll have something that's cost versus power output. I have some cost on the y-axis and some power output on the x-axis. And this is some increasing curve, right? because the more power you want, the higher the cost. Okay. And then we're going to reference everything to a hourly schedule. When we talk about things, we'll talk about a like dollar per hour, this sort of idea, right? So if I want to generate this megawatt um, amount for one hour, this is the cost, right? how much money I was putting for this, right? So this is true for generators such as, uh, you know, coal or gas or oil. Right? However, you know, the cost curve may not be so clear for some other generator. For example, if you're a nuclear generator, what does your cost curve look like? Right? For something like coal generators, you know, definitely is the increasing curve you cost more to generate more power. But for something like nuclear, what happens? It should be a, a flat curve except for refuels. Right, for a nuclear, you basically have a cost of zero if you're off. Right? Your fuel cost is so low compared to the infrastructure and everything like that. Nuclear is basically zero cost for all intents and purposes. If you're on, you, are, you will deliver power at whatever amount of money. So this is for some, for example, something like gas. If you're something like nuclear, your basically your cost curve is almost zero. Right? So okay, nuclear so also doesn't go to cannot generate zero power from it. But you're in nuclear, you have a sort of very limited range, and you almost this is almost zero cost, or very close to zero cost very close to zero cost, right? So similarly for things like hydro, hydro, if you're generating power, it costs you no money. 
If your arm doesn't cost you any more money to generate power, so hydro is you know almost always comes in at zero cost. Uh, wind and solar is more complicated than that, but also their operating cost is essentially zero. It doesn't cost money to generate power. Okay, so there are different types of generators. Some of them has this sort of very intuitive cost: more power means higher cost. Although some generators doesn't have this, right? So this actually leads to one interesting question: Is how do I pay generators? Do I pay generators by their cost? Right? How do we pay generators? Right? So you know, somebody owns a nuclear power plant, somebody owns a hydro power plant. You need to pay the people who's providing power. So how do you think the people are getting paid? Right, so if you're a nuclear power plant, you say, okay, I'm going to generate power at whatever cost, right? essentially a zero cost. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll generate power. But then at the end of the day, how do you pay them? PPA, what, sorry, can I spell PPA? I'm not familiar with the term in chat, what's PPA? A power purchase agreement. Yeah, so you can, power purchase agreement is a uh, longer term, it's for yearly terms, right? Less, but power purchase agreement is generally when, you know, one load buys power from one generator. But let's say I'm running this, you know, in a real time, in day ahead, and uh, I'm trying to optimize this power coming from different places. So if a nuclear power has zero cost, do I just pay a nuclear power zero? Like do I just pay the power plant zero? Do I just pay hydro zero? Like, uh, do I pay one zero? Do I say, okay, you know, you, there's no cost for you to generate power, so let me just not pay you anything. All right, so that's not how at least, uh, no, it's not a flat rate. It's not a flat rate. Right? So, so of course you pay dollars per kilowatt hour. Right? The question is, how do you determine the amount of dollar you should pay? How I talk, like for example, if I have a you know, system, I have a hydro generator and a gas generator, do I just pay the gas generator and not pay hydro? Because gas is a lot more expensive than hydro. Right? So that obviously is wrong, right? It uh, doesn't work. Right? So this is actually a quite interesting question. And uh, we, we need some math actually to get to the actual payment scheme using the US. And that requires sort of a surprising amount of non-trivial math to understand this. Okay, so we'll, we won't get here, uh, we won't, we may or may not get to this class, but we'll eventually get there. We'll look at, you know, how do people get paid? And that actually comes out from solving the optimization problem. So it's quite a sort of elegant theory. The theory is quite elegant, we'll cover. But uh, let's, so we'll work through, we'll work towards that, that sort of theory. So let's go to the idea as part of that theory actually comes down to the incremental cost curve, right? Incremental cost curve. So what we want to have is this as in units of cost per hour. Often what we care about is a little bit more of the derivative of this cost curve. So often what we want to know is not the exact cost per hour, Often we want to know as the delta of the fuel cost over the current changing out power versus the power curve. Okay, this is just a fancy way of saying I want the derivative of the cost. I just I want the derivative of the cost, right? So this is. It's often more interesting what the derivative is, not the absolute cost, right? So this is in dollar per megawatt hour. So you can think of this as the cost of a delta increase in power. Okay, so you can think of this as the cost of the next little unit of power. So if you draw the derivative of this curve, you get something that's dollar per megawatt hour. 
And this is, you know, a flatter line, I guess. Something like this, right, for a derivative. Okay. So this is the uh, derivative of the cost, right? So this is the cost, the power. And this is very often, that, that, this is actually more intuitive of how we think about it, right? So let's say if you're buying something like a computer, right? What you get is a unit price. No, that's a thousand dollars for this computer. Nobody gives you that, oh, it takes me a total cost of hundred million dollars to give you this batch of computer. That's not how we think of when we buy stuff. When you buy stuff, you think about dollar per unit of the stuff you're buying. So this incremental cost curves is used to help us think about you know, the price instead of the aggregate cost, which is also useful interpretation we'll have. Okay, so this is something to keep in mind. We, we can talk about the total cost of doing something, or we can talk about the price of doing something. Okay, both, are, both are useful. Both are useful concepts for us. So, but let's look at the mathematical formulation. Right. We will get to the economic interpretation later. I look at the math first, right? So the math first is, let's say we have some objective function. So here, just an example, I have three generators, I have one load. Okay. So these are the generators. This is the load. Okay. So let's assume every one of them has a cost curve. So CA is the cost for Generator A, so uh, CB and you know, CC similarly. So our goal is always to minimize, right? Our goal is always to be minimize this cost and right? minimize the total cost of generating power subject to some constraints, right? It's not just minute, right? It's so a subject to some constraint. So what constraints do you think is, exist in the system? What, what are the right constraints we should have? Right, so I have three generators of a load. And the, their cost is the total cost of generating power from those three generators. But what is the right uh, constraint we should have? Uh, the generator is probably of a maximum amount of power they can generate. Right, so there's unit constraints, right? There's a, something called a unit constraint. Because generator not only have max, but also have minimum amount of power, right? So they cannot generate power arbitrarily in arbitrary units. So we have something like similar for PB, similar for PC, right? There's the upper and lower bound for the generator, how much power can generate. Right? There's another constraint, right? There's the most important constraint. What's the most important constraint we have in the system? What happened to the load? How does the load show up in this optimization problem? So far, the costs only have generators in it. The constraint only have generators. What happened to my load? How does that enter into this mathematical formulation? It needs to be like requiring power. Right, uh, we need something called the power balance constraint, right? Is that the PA plus PV plus PC equal to the PL? Right, so the L, so we're gonna use just L for the load, right? Not, not P for simplicity convention, but that's a correct constraint, right? PA plus PB plus PC should equal to L, right? So total amount of generation I have in the network, the system, should equal to the load. However, uh, each generator has their own constraint. There is an upper and lower bound. Okay, so altogether, this is the optimization problem. Okay, so the caveat here, or not the caveat, but the sort of the big, big thing here we have is we're not going to consider voltage angle yet. Okay, we're going to do things just from a power perspective. Right, we're gonna talk about voltage angle later. For now, we're gonna do things from a power perspective because it's already not so trivial if you just talk about power. Okay, we're gonna assume power can be transferred. Okay, as long as the total amount of power generated equals total load, there's some way to transfer power. 
We're not gonna quite yet think about voltage and voltage and angle. Not yet. Okay, just think about power. But even when we think of power, this ends up being the this is the constraint optimization problem. And yeah, this constraint optimization, right? It's optimizing, optimizing cost subject to a bunch of constraints. There are equality constraints, there are inequality constraints, or things like that. Okay. So if we look at uh, right, so does anybody have an idea how to solve this? Uh, folks, who has no idea how to solve this problem? <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming sort of a lot of people have no idea how to solve this. Okay. So we're going to go slow. So constraint optimization is a huge field. Okay. For example, most of my research you can think of as working with constraint optimization problems. We're going to scratch the surface, you know, we're going to do a minimum amount in this, but we're going to give you an idea, enough idea to understand how power system works and uh, you know how to basic and go relay this optimize, sorry, this does not say how you get paid, okay? Nothing in this, even if you solve this, it does not say how do you pay each generator. So I'm gonna to try to relate the solution of this optimization problem to the amount of money we should pay the generator. So we're gonna to try to relate all this together. I'm gonna to do this in a sort of very special way. We're gonna do this in a quite special way, okay? All right. And uh, so as a review, before we go to a constraint optimization, Suppose I have a single variable or just unconstrained optimization. Suppose I have this unconstrained optimization. I say X is in a you know, higher dimensional space. This is not in one one dimensional, but higher dimensional space. How do we solve this? This you guys should have seen before. Unconstrained optimization. Any ideas how to solve this? Let me remember. No, there's no equality constraint, no inequality constraint. I'm just giving you a function, right? So this function maps, say from you know R n to R. If you like, you can think of this example: x one squared plus x two minus three squared plus x one times x two, something like this. Right? Okay, this, this has actually no solution. Yeah, so. Uh, I'm gonna make, yeah, it was something like this. Okay, something like this. How do you solve this kind of problems? Anybody remember this? You should have seen basic calculus. At least. So the derivative? Right, you basically take the gradient, right? You compute gradient of f, right? So the higher, higher dimensional derivative is a gradient. x1, the xn, you set this equal to zero, you solve the system equation, right? you solve the system. Okay? This is an unconstrained optimization, that's how we solve it. Okay? So for a constrained optimization, turns out, we'll try to relate to this unconstrained optimization. Okay, so it turns out for many constrained optimization problems, the way to solve them is to turn them into an unconstrained problem, and then solve the unconstrained problem. Okay, we'll see how to do this. We'll basically see how to do this. Right? But any question with a goal, with our goal, right? Our goal is just to solve an equation of this optimization of this type. Okay. Right. So I guess one thing you can see if you really enjoy this, maybe you should consider going to grad school. Or if you hate this and you never want to see this again, maybe you don't, right? Maybe you don't go to grad school. But this will give you a taste of you know what at least sort the researching power system looks like. Most of our time spent on looking at constraint optimization, probably like this. All right. So we're going to have a generic uh, uh, notation for this, right? Just because it's easy once you have a, a common notation. So we're going to mean x1 over xn. Okay. So each of them is a real number you can think of. Okay. Sorry. So this x is, so we don't have a subscript. 
we write this as a vector. Uh, so we're going to minimize our bunch our vector essentially min over x. Subject two. We're going to use uh, omega for reasons I'm not quite sure, but the convention is to use omega for equality constraints. Okay, so this is called the objective function. These all together are called the equality constraints. Okay, these are called equality constraints. So here we have n variables. Right, we have x1 to xn and m constraints. Okay, m constraints. And uh, we're asking to find the minimum. Uh, you can think of F being cost, minimum cost solution that satisfy all these constraints. So here again, if you have any questions, please ask about the formulation, right? So there'll be a, a lot of notation in this. Uh, the idea wouldn't be very difficult, but there's quite a bit of notation we're using. Okay? So anytime you have any question, please ask. Okay. So, so yeah, go ahead. The function F like the, that's like the L equal to like the P1 plus P2 plus No, 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 no. L is the objective function, right? L is this, objective. Oh, this function. Objective. L is objective. L is the cost of generation. If you want to have mental picture in your mind, it's the cost of generation, right? How about the W1, W2? These are the equality constraint. Okay. Right, so. Yeah, this is actually omega. So if you look at the typed up notes, I don't know why it's omega. In my handwriting, it looks like it's W. <laughs> so I'm gonna call this omega. So omega one to omega m is the, they are the equality constraints. So for example, we may have one equality constraint, you know, total generation equals the total load. We may have many, but again, the objective is just a single number. Okay, objective should be a real number. Okay, so it can it does not express constraints in this context. Constraint is a condition that the solution must satisfy. Right. So again, in the generation in the uh, economic dispatch case, it is the idea that objective is a generation cost. Constraint is a load equals generation constraint. Okay, so these are sort of different entities we have together that make up one optimization problem. Right? But there are sort of two types of entities or two types of things in the optimization problem. Any other questions about this? Yeah, I may have missed this. Can you yeah. explain what the min times st means again? Like, what is the time? Oh, what is this? Okay, mean is minimized, right? So mean is minimized f. So in words, this reads like. Okay, so minimize objective function. S T stands for subject two. Okay, so in words, this says minimize f. This x says this f over x. Okay, so x are the variables I have, right? The generator generation levels. So this says minimize f over the variables x subject to this equality constraint. So in English, it reads out like this. So that's an English reading. Cool, thank you. Yeah, right. So, yeah, okay. It's, it's good questions. Yeah. So this is, yeah, again, I work on this quite a bit. So I may, you know, I may miss some things. I, I, right, so any questions, please ask. Right, so, right. So in English, this again, so x is optimization variable. So we write it under the minimum, under the mean. Means we're optimizing over this set of variables. Right, this is important because, for example, again, if we go back to this example, the, Optimization variables are PA, PB, and PC. L is not an optimization variable, right? You cannot change L. You're not, we're not optimizing over L in technical jargon. Right? L is a fixed number in a sense. We're minimizing over the generation at ABC. Okay, so this is the mean over X, and the X is a set of variables we're going to optimize over. F is objective function. ST stands for subject to functional constraint. Any other questions about this?
Okay, so uh, all right, so let's do some sort of basic equation counting first. So I have n decision variables, m equality constraints. There are three possibilities, right? So if m is greater than n, if you have more constraints than variables, what happens? I said I'll give you optimization problem, but I'll give you more equality constraints than the number of variables you have. What would then what happens in this case? There will be more than one solution. Is there more than one solution? I have more constraints than variables. How many solutions do I have? No, only one solution. More constraints than variables. More constraints than variables. Probably no solution. Probably no solution, right? So more constraints than variables. This is probably no solution and uh, you should probably give up. So this is likely no solution. And your response uh, should be, I cannot solve the problem. Okay. There's more constraints than variables, right? How can I satisfy all the constraints at the same time? So give up on this case. If you use a solver, the solver will do this check and basically will tell you I give up. If you give a solver more variables and more constraints than variables. So if m equals to n, probably one solution, but there's nothing to optimize. Okay, you have only one solution. The notion of minimum cost is not so important. There's only one solution, right? There's the cost is whatever the function evaluation is at that solution. Okay. So now that all that interesting. This is, for example, the power flow problem. Right? The problem we solved is given PQ, PV bus, fund via data, there's only one solution. So there's nothing to optimize in that case. It becomes interesting if M is less than N, then we have some optimization. Okay? There's room for optimization. You know, there are maybe many solutions. One of them is better than the others as judged by the objective function. Okay, so when we solve a constraint optimization problem, we often want to see that there are many solutions. Right? There's more than one. There's, there's, there's more variables and constraints. Okay, so we'll uh, basically, so one example, right? Well, you can think of this one example. This is a common example we'll have seeing the generation case, right? So, right, so here you can interpret this as cost x1, x2 as generation. We're not gonna look at the inequality constraint yet, okay? So there's no upper lower bound. And the upper lower bound, five is the load. Okay, All right, so this is one sort of example with numbers. And then we can ask what is the minimum x1, x2 solution to this? Okay, we can ask this question. All right, so we can't solve this yet, but uh, you know, we should be, it turns out solving this question is not so difficult. Turns out this is not so difficult. Okay. All right. So if I give this question to you, I ask you, okay, go solve it. What will you do? I mean, there is sort of at least one easy way to solve this this particular problem, for example. Like if in the midterm, I just happen to give you this question, and I said, oh, this is worth you know half of the points on the midterm. How you solve this? I guess what I would do is uh, use the omega function to put one variable in terms of the other variable, plug it into the f function, right. and then optimize it. Right. So, right. So, the trivial thing is, you know, so you cannot solve this as a system of equations, right? Because one is a minimization. You don't have one equality constraint. There is no system of equations. You have one equation. Right. So, the, what I think what James said was correct is I can do substitution. Right? 
That's an equality constraint. I can write x1 in terms of x2, for example, and get an unconstrained problem. So let's look at what happens when we do this thing, right? So you now we can do this with more generic variables. We don't need to use numbers in that case. This, we can do this with more generic variables, right? So let's say some cost C1, some cost C2, and the minimizes total cost subject, I have, they add up to a total load L. So the first thing we can do is we can do it by substitution, right? We do this by substitution. We can say x2 is L minus x1. This is just from this equality constraint. Then, then my C total cost becomes A1 plus A2 plus A2 plus B1 x1 squared plus b2 l minus x1 squared. Okay. This I can do. Okay. This I do by substitution. Now I get an unconstrained quadratic optimization problem. So I take a derivative. Right. This is no constraint. This is called an unconstrained problem. So I can take a derivative respect to x1, right? I can take this derivative. This is 2b1x1 minus 2b2l minus x1. This has to be equal to 0. So x1 equals to b2 times l over b1 plus b2. Okay. I can substitute x2 equals l minus x1 into this. I got b1 over b1 plus b2 times l. Right, so this is, I can do this. But I, I can definitely do this. I can solve the problem. I can tell you, oh, they generate the power proportionally according to this, you know, b1, b1 over b1 plus b2 term. This is what I get. So first of all, any questions with this process, the things I did? Any questions? Okay, we should also think about what's no good about this? What's bad about solving this way? What is unsatisfying about solving a problem this way? Right, there are several problems. One, if I have basically nonlinear equality constraint, you cannot do this. I have a nonlinear equality constraint, you cannot do this. If my objective function is not quadratic, then this is probably not easy to solve. And it does not give me any intuition into the solution. Okay, this is a very mechanical way of solving a problem. For example, it does not tell me how to pay the generator. Okay, I can solve for generation dispatch. It doesn't tell me how to pay people. Okay, this, that is totally missing out of this. Okay, so as an engineer, we usually when you look at this sort of uh, things, you're not happy about it. That's difficult to do. You have to do substitutions. For example, you have more than one constraint. The substitution becomes very complicated. You have, the constraints are not linear. This thing go, totally goes out the window and really provides no intuition. Okay, so as engineers, as engineers, what engineers like best as if the math works out the way we think it will work out. Okay, right? So engineers, what we like is we want to look at the problem and say, ah, I have some intuition about this. And the math should work out the way my intuition works out, my, uh, my, align with my intuition. This method gives you no intuition. So I just say, plug in, crank it, you know, something comes out. Okay. So the way we think about it, right? So it's sort of the advanced version of thinking about constraint optimization is to solve it using something called Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so this is a very important, very important term. And the idea is to solve it using Lagrange multipliers because these are the Lagrange multipliers actually gives you quite a bit of intuition. There is quite a bit of intuition provided by the Lagrangian, by the multipliers. Okay, so, okay, so we'll work through, we'll basically try to get 
or try to say what they are, or get some intuition on why they're important, and uh, how they're used to pay generators. It turns out, you know, should you understand Lagrange multipliers? Well, every time you pay your bill, you know, about 40% of your bill is determined by some Lagrange multiplier in some system. It's actually, you know, impacting how much money you pay. So worthwhile to understand what they are. Okay. It'll take us a little bit of effort to get there, but sort of it's worthwhile once we get there. So we'll get there by looking at things like a gradient. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll basically get an idea of what these multipliers are and what they come out of. And to do that, we need, we need to you know, think about calculus and think about gradient, do a little bit of review of you know, multi-dimensional calculus, which is not, not terribly hard. It's sort of, and uh, since we'll be just de dealing with quadratic functions, this gradient is not terribly hard. So the gradient of this function is basically a vector that have all the partial derivatives. Okay, we'll have all the partial derivatives. And for this class, for us, f is quadratic most of the time. Okay. So the, at least this partial derivative is a simple thing to do. Okay. So this is our gradient. So there are some uh, interpretations of the gradient. Uh, interpretation of the gradient. So the interpretation is basically if you look at a single component, let's say if you look at a single component, say df dx1, this tells you, this tells you the rate of change, the rate of change along the first component, right? This is the, what the derivative means. If you look at the entire vector altogether, if you look at this entire vector altogether, what does this entire vector say? Right? If a single derivative is a rate of change in this one component, then what does this vector tell us? Okay, basically what this vector does, it tells us the rate of change the maximum rate of change, right? The direction that has the maximum rate of change. Okay? So this vector, if you look at the function, if you look at the function, this, this is a vector, and this vector tells us in which direction is the function changing the fastest. Okay, so that's be better if we do an example. So let's look at an example. Let's look at a simple quadratic function, okay, ax2 plus uh, ax squared plus by squared. You take the gradient, it just two ax to by. Okay? So we can look at some of the gradients in some of the points, in okay, some of the points in the function. For example, let's say this point is x1, 0, x1, 0. So if you look at the gradient of the function evaluate x1 and 0, you get something that's 2a and 0. Okay. Is this clear? Is this clear up to now? So we're going to look at this point on the x-axis. We're going to evaluate the gradient on this axis. This gradient has a non-zero, right? X, co x component has 0 in the y component. So the gradient points in this direction gradient point in this direction. But graphically, so geometrically, what does this mean if the gradient points in this direction? Directly, right, so this means the, if you want this, this function basically is growing very rapidly in this direction. It's very growing rapidly in the x direction, right? So this gradient means if you look at the function, if you look at this function, this gradient is, tells you this, is grow, this function is growing rapidly in the x direction if you move along the x direction. Okay? If you move along the y direction, the function doesn't change very much. 
Okay, so you, if you're moving along the x direction, this is what the gradient tells you. Similarly, if you look at this point, let's say 0, y1, the gradient at this point is 0 to b. Okay, so this tells you if we x1, y1, so this tells you the function is changing, changing in this y direction, in the y direction. Similarly for other points. Okay. Any questions right now? All right, so then let's look at this. Okay, so here I drew three colors, right? I drew three rings of different colors. There's an orange one, there's a yellow one, there's a green one, there's a red one. What are these curves? For example, what is this orange curve? and the green curve and the red curve. So these curves are something called the level set, right? The level set, the cost of the function. So the orange, let's say look at this orange curve. This is when the cost equal to a constant. Every point, on this orange curve as equal cost, right? It's equal functional value, right? This function just an ellipse, right? So a, a squared, ax squared plus by squared. So this is the ellipse. So you set the function to a constant value. What you do is you trace out this ellipse. Okay? You trace out this ellipse, right? right? And the gradient is basically tangent to this ellipse, okay? So this ellipse, Sorry, it's perpendicular to the tangent, right? So at this point, this is a tangent, and this uh, the gradient is perpendicular to it. If you look at this point, this is tangent, and the gradient turns out to be perpendicular to all these tangents. Okay, so the geometric interpretation of the gradient is that they are the perpendicular vectors to the tangent of the function at a particular point. Okay, so this is what the, uh, this is what it tells us. Okay, this is geometric interpretation of the gradient. Okay. So what does this have to do with anything, right? So what does this have to do with uh, the, any, anything that happens? What does this have to do with optimization, right? Well, why, why is this gradient, you know, why, why does it matter for, for our optimization purposes? Well. Yeah, well, let's think about this. Okay. Let's say I'm just going to mean this. Okay. Okay. Let's say I'm just going to mean this and forget about the constraint. Let's say there's no constraints. I'm just going to mean over ax and y. What is the solution to this? What is the solution to this minimization problem? No constraints. So this one, this is a trivial optimization problem, right? I have x squared, y squared, just zero, zero, right? So this is a solution to this problem. Okay. So how do we understand this from a gradient perspective, right? So we know the solution is when gradient of f equal to zero, right? So we said that, okay, to solve this unconstrained minimization, all we need to do is look at when gradient equals to zero. So how do we understand this geometrically? Why is it that we have a solution to the minimization problem when the gradient is zero? Or what happens when the gradient is not zero? Okay, so if you look at this, right? Let's look at this. The level sets of this function, basically let's say this level set. And then let's say at this point, I have a gradient, okay? So I can ask the following question. Is this point the minimum? Can this point be the minimum? It has a gradient? The answer is no. Because gradient tells me when the function increases. Conversely, in the opposite direction, the function value has to decrease. The function value has to decrease when you move opposite to the gradient. 
So the gradient is now zero. It means you can increase the function value along the gradient. Conversely, decrease the function value when we go negative to the gradient. Okay? So if the gradient is now zero, this point cannot be optimal because there's a direction to go that reduces the cost. Right? For example, I can go to this ellipse that has a smaller cost. Okay, so cost decreases. I can always decrease the cost. This process only stops when you get to the origin. Okay? Okay? So the only place when the gradient is zero is at x is zero, y equals zero. Right? Because the gradient is zero at this point. Okay? So great. So the idea that we should, the minimum of the function occurs when the gradient is zero means that when the gradient is zero, geometrically, there's no direction to go. I cannot move along the uh, I cannot move along the gradient anymore. Okay, the, as long as the gradient is non-zero, there's always a direction I can move along to reduce the cost. But if the gradient is zero, means that there's you know there's no direction to go, and I stop. Okay, I stop along this direction. Okay. So this is a geometric interpretation for unconstrained optimization. Right, it will turn out for the constraint optimization, the picture is essentially correct. It turns out for constraint optimization, the, the picture is correct. You basically want to follow the gradient, or you want to look at the gradient until you cannot move anymore. Right? So the gradient tells you the direction to move. For unconstrained optimization, you, can, you basically move until the gradient is zero. For constraint optimization, because there is a constraint, the gradient still tell you a lot of information. Basically tell you where to go and where to stop. That's what the gradient tells you. So the geometry does not change very much actually from constraint, unconstrained to constraint. Okay? But we'll cover that next time. The so next time essentially basically we'll extend the ge this geometric picture to a case when you have constraints. You know, extend to a case when you have constraints. And we'll look at what the gradient tells us and how does that interact with the constraints? And out of that comes out something called a multiplier. That's just the way this works out. But geometrically, you should think of, let's say these three rings, these circles, or these ellipses, are the different level of cost. I always want to jump inside just to reduce cost. The constraint st essentially eventually stop me from doing this. The constraint stop me from doing this. But, I want to basically follow the gradient as much as possible until the constraint tells me to stop. And there's a way to geometrically understand this. Okay? And we'll do that next time. Uh, we'll basically present the, uh, also the algebra or the machinery of solving this type of question. It will turn out to be not very difficult. It's not any more difficult than this. Okay? Not any more difficult than this. Okay? All right. So. Uh, so any questions? If not, I'll see you next Monday and the homework will be posted later today for this week. All right, thanks guys. You guys can ask, go for it. I can go first. I guess it's just to really start for the, uh, it's again for the power flow. Mm -hmm. I guess I was wondering why is it that, so I know power in, ter in terms of the sign, mm -hmm. I know if, uh, we have power is equal to the magnitude of the parent power times the sign of the angle, right? Or sorry, it's the cosine. But okay. why, why can we say the admittance times the sign of the difference of the angles? is the power flow. Oh, why can't I say that? Uh, just if you look at the power flow equation, if you assume the, it's purely inductive, so G is zero. Okay, okay. Right, okay. basically that wipes out the cosine term in the active power flow. You only have the sign to left over. For that one. Okay, I forgot about those. Okay, yeah, thank you.